Hi, and thanks for joining us for Mastering the Next Generation of Kansas Science Standards. My name is Francis Vigeon. I'm CEO here at NOAAdam, but I'm also a former teacher. Uh, my background is uh, first as a high school math teacher, and then as an elementary and middle school STEM specialist. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk with you today about the Next Generation Science Standards in Kansas and the really sort of the implementation process and the shifts that are happening. Um, if you are a NOATOM user, then this is nothing you have to worry about. It's, you're welcome to hang here with us and, and learn about uh, the shifts and, and sort of where they're happening. But um, the, the, the average classroom is facing a lot of big changes as a, real, as a result of the Next Generation Science Standards and not really the changes that have hit the media, but really changes in terms of the type of instruction and the type of assessment and the type of um, learning that you can really expect as a result of engage, engaging in science in K-12 uh, under the new standards. To just give you a little bit of background about us here at NOATOM, we're based just north of Boston in Salem, Massachusetts. And uh, we serve schools and districts all over the country, actually around the world. And our focus and our, our interest and our passion uh, around science isn't just because it's science. It, it, our passion is, as educators ourselves, um, really focused on higher order thinking, the creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skills that we all want our students to develop as a result of their time in our classroom. And so science, technology, and engineering, and math is really the perfect disciplines to engage students in those critical thinking skills, particularly because we can do that by putting students in the role of scientist and engineer, hands-on, project-based, and active in the classroom, active learning. Um, and so, you know, thoughts about curriculum materials, professional development, uh, those serve that purpose, uh, but really emanate from much higher things. And so as you think about the next generation science standards and the curriculum materials and professional development, what you really need to be thinking about is the purpose first and the kind of environment that you need to create and then the resources that actually support creating that kind of environment. So, you know, no, Adam, we do... I mean, our, our everyday is really uh, producing those resources. So if you're interested to see what a next generation aligned unit is from a teacher's perspective or a student's perspective, you know, we'd welcome you to do that. You can check out at noadam.com, go to the top, you'll see STEM curriculum, you can scroll down and pick any grade you want to see. Um, we have a, all the other units, which you would see there is about a month worth of, of information. But if you want to see more than that, we have it available. But the, the focus here is really to uh, think a bit about what makes the next generation science standards a bit tougher in Kansas and how do those standards link to Common Core, ELA, and math. How does this change really affect the method for instruction or what we call the pedagogy uh, K-12? And how is it that we're really preparing students for other disciplines as well and even disciplines such as art or the arts? Uh, through what we are teaching, and really this three-dimensional learning that everybody's talking about. To kind of orient you in the Kansas process if you don't already sort of have this memorized. The first year, which Kansas calls year zero, <laughs> so I guess it's not really a year. Um, it's something though. It's, anyhow, so 2013-2014, the, the Kansas College and Career Readiness Science Standards Implementation Plan was really focused on making sure folks got familiar with the standards. We're beginning to develop methods and resources that could be used to address next generation science standards. 2014-15 was really trying to focus on integrating practices into instruction because the practices dimension really focuses, it's all about skills. Now, there's a misconception which is actually articulated um, on the Kansas Department of Education's website and you can actually see it here, guided integration of the science and engineering practices. Well, 
guiding a practice is, you know, you have to really be careful um, how you interpret that. And the reason I mention this is because a practice really cannot be guided. It can be coached, but it can't, guiding something really is almost synonymous in, in education with facilitating. And so there's a very big difference here. You cannot facilitate a practice. So if you define guiding as coaching, then that's the proper understanding. Uh, but if you're defining it as facilitating, then you've got a misconception that you have to be very careful about. Now, the reason I, I say that is that the purpose of these new standards is to, you know, I'm talking about putting students in the role of scientists or engineer. Think about learning to ride a bike. Uh, scientists and engineers in these new standards are all about developing not only knowledge but skills and the ability to connect content uh, in terms of its behavior, the way that it functions systematic. Um, you, when you ride a bike, you have uh, to develop a skill and you have to be able to balance and deal with gravity and friction and uh, you know momentum and inertia you're dealing with all these kind of different forces so riding a bike is not something you can learn from a book it's not something somebody can tell you how to do you can get a little bit of coaching but at the end of the day you have to get on the bike and you actually have to do it so it's not something that's really guided it's something that's coached because it can't be facilitated by what somebody really says or shows you. So keep that in mind, um, that students, the, the purpose of why we're learning science has changed from just basically knowing facts to being able to take the facts you know and actually develop and use them and extend that knowledge into an area which you are unfamiliar with by sourcing new information from a, something that you're given, a scenario, for instance. So in 2014-15, that's what the focus was, was getting instruction to really focus on practices and piloting new units and assessments. 2015 was supposed to be about refining that and really implementing new curriculum and fully adopting the next generation science standards into the classroom. So the classroom environment reflects a next generation inquiry environment. And I think, I think that it's fair to say that um, you know, I think that's a stretch for a lot of folks uh, in Kansas, but also elsewhere across the country. So if you still find yourself a year or two behind, you're not alone. Uh, but what's important to realize is that federal testing requirements as a result of No Child Left Behind, um, sort of the legacy of that is that there are federal testing requirements and science is required to be tested. So I'm not saying that the purpose of teaching science is to, you know, deal with a test. But what I'm saying is that when you are considering what you're doing in the classroom as it relates to science, there is an accountability point for this. Now I'll talk to you a bit more about the California uh, assessment, not California, I'm sorry, the Kansas assessments, but um, you know, once those come into alignment, um, which they are now coming into alignment, you're going to realize, and I'm actually quoting um, the Kansas Department of Education when I tell you this, that a student who doesn't pass that assessment is not going to be prepared for the next grade or grade span. You know, if they don't, if they're not able to achieve proficiency or greater on the elementary grade five test, they're not going to be that's evidence right there that they are not prepared for middle school and likewise if in the middle school not being prepared for high, high school and then on to college. So really, really key that you take the time now that you have available to really um, consider what this environment is all about, what these standards are all about. And that's why I think the first piece that you really need to know in terms of mastering the next generation science standards is that, the, that those new standards 
are based on the nature of science and engineering itself. And it's something that you need to know, but more importantly, your students need to have internalized and be able to orient themselves within this process. So the nature of science and engineering is very simple. It's cyclical, in fact. Science is knowledge from experimentation, that scientists ask questions, and they answer those questions by developing uh, experiments, and they carry out those experiments, which are planned by them, to gather data, and they use that data to reflect back on whether or not their hypothesis, the hypothetical answer to that question was true or false, or was supported or not supported, and they reason that claim from evidence. That is new scientific knowledge, and this is not my definition, this is really the, how it's defined in the standards. So engineers use that knowledge of science to solve problems. So engineers identify problems and solve them by developing potential solutions called prototypes, which they test, they gather the data, and they use that data to solve the problem. So engineers solve problems using their knowledge of science, and when, it's, when they actually find a solution to that problem and it becomes scaled, that's what technology is. Technology solves problems. Now, not all technology and what engineers do involve building, in fact, Building implies that it's physical, but engineers develop things which are not physical. Software, processes for quality control, um, all of those things are non-physical. It's cyclical because the technology helps the scientist answer and ask new and unanswered questions and new questions, um, and so develop new knowledge, and, and that new knowledge it helps engineers develop new technology. And the, kind of an example of this would be engineers developing technology of space probes to gather data with sensors and planets and places where we've not been able to travel. Scientists may have knowledge about those places but not access to the probe or the technology to gather the necessary data to be able to test a hypothesis. So, um, so that's kind of an example there. Math is in the center of it all because math is the primary tool for capturing observations quantitatively, which is absolutely necessary on both sides. If you're engineering something and not testing it and gathering quantitative data, you're not actually engineering anything, you're crafting. Same in the case of science. The, um, so you're capturing the data, but then you're analyzing it using math and you're communicating it using math. And in fact, you need math, the precision that math gives us to be able to develop a replicable experiment, a particu in particular a procedure that has a precision level of precision that can be replicated. This takes place um, in the classroom, right, where students are engaging in scientists and engineers and learning about the nature and relationship of, of science and engineering and so on. The big problem, which is kind of notorious uh, when you think of the indicators for the old Kansas assessments, is that there's a traditional model of instruction that uh, folks struggle with. And unfortunately, it sometimes is, it can be a, a bigger struggle for people who are content specialists than it is for content generalists at the earlier grades, because the earlier grades, uh, children won't sit and listen to you for an hour. and um, they don't necessarily care what you think or want to, you know, copy what you're doing, um, just because they're developmentally at a different place. And you know that may be a little bit of an overstatement. Of, of course, you know, and the children, you know, are, are uh, in tune with with what's happening and wanting to please the teacher. But on the flip side, the point I'm trying to make is that that uh, the teachers are not always the conduit the conduit for content at that level. What they try to do is they try to involve children in learning by experiencing things and oftentimes they position themselves as learning alongside the children. The traditional model of instruction that we typically see that really comes in as you get towards fourth and fifth grade and up is that people get into and are taught to get into a traditional model of instruction where the content flows through the teacher, that the teacher plays this role of expert where they model the facts, demonstrate phenomena, and explain what, and then the student's role 
is really just to absorb it all and mirror it back. And the idea there is that if a student can recall the facts and repeat the demonstrations and, re and summarize the phenomenon, then, well, they're, they're proficient, right? They can fill in the box. That doesn't fly anymore. And I'll show you why. In a next generation inquiry model, the teacher's role is not to hand out the facts and to be the expert. The teacher's role is to be the coach and to, str and, and to get out of the way of the children interacting with the content and instead coach the children so that the, 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 they're in closer contact with the, with the content and actually developing and using it. So under the Next Generation Science Standards, because they're three-dimensional and they bring in this practices dimension, which is really skills, students are developing these skills and they are using them to develop and use the content, which is the disciplinary core ideas, and observe the phenomenon, which is the cross-cutting concepts. The teacher coaches this by gradually adjusting the supports, helping the students understand how to engage appropriately, and redirecting and monitoring when appropriate. The student shows their proficiency by actually evidence of having those skills, by developing and using the content, by engaging the skills to solve problems and answer questions. So think about a problem or a question that plays out in this scenario. And being able to use system behavior to understand and describe the dynamic interactions between different pieces of content. That's what happens in this environment. That's not, if a teacher gets between the student and the content, then there's no, op th there's no uh, robust opportunity for students to demonstrate their skills and really practice and have the opportunity to experiment authentically with their own ideas. They, so that's why teachers have to get out of that place and get into a more skillful role of coaching, uh, and typically coaching small teams, teams of two, of students in the class where they are really working collaboratively uh, to try and solve a problem or answer a question. That's why you see the standards taking this form in their documentation. So the standard is a performance expectation. It's what a student's going to be expected to perform as a result of instruction. And that is going to have to be performed in a context. So think about the context as being defined by the three dimensions with some assistance from the clarification statement and the assessment boundary. Clarification statement just helps kind of give a sense, like in this case, that we're talking about food chains and food webs. The assessment boundary just gives us a good sense that we're not talking about molecular transfer of matter, so something like the carbon cycle. Okay. The three dimensions below those foundation boxes are the actual sort of, I don't know, um, properties, I would call them, if we're thinking scientifically here, they're the properties of the context that students should be experiencing this in the classroom and that they can expect to be having to demonstrate their understanding in that context later on. So the science engineering practices, the skills dimension, those are the skills that are absolutely necessary in order to develop and use the content, which is a disciplinary course, and observe the cross-cutting concepts. It doesn't mean that those are the only practices involved. It just means that those are the absolutely necessary ones. Same thing with the disciplinary core ideas and the cross-cutting concepts. Now, one of the big misconceptions under the Next Generation Science Standards is that these are grade level uh, specific standards such that they should, they should occur in those grades only. Um, in order to have so this is the difference between curriculum and standards. The standards are grade level specific because they're giving targets that a student should have mastered this by, you know, whatever grade, whether it's fifth or third. The role of curriculum is to get students to nurture them to a level of proficiency in those standards and also maintain it. And so the thing is that when you look at EQIP uh, uh, guidelines for science as well as the peak PEEC guidelines for um, alignment, what you'll see is that they don't want standards happening in isolation and uh, being sort of uh, left to a grade level. What you want to be doing is pooling the standards so that students are learning multiple standards and multiple 
dimensions at the same time. So they see the interconnectedness of the different disciplines and, and realistic contexts of really scenarios. And then the um, the grade, like from one grade level to the next, the way that plays out is that think about it as introducing or one grade level is reinforcing the standards of the prior grade level, and grade levels really plural, mastering the standards of that grade level and introducing aspects of standards from future grade levels. So that's how this kind of plays out. And so a really well-formed curriculum is actually going to do that. It's going to be introducing, mastering, and reinforcing standards within the grade level and from adjacent grade levels. And that way there, a student who is sick, absent, a newcomer, whatever, it's not once and done so that that child ends up at a loss for, you know, having not been exposed or not retained that one instance of the standard appearing in your curriculum over the score, over the, you know, course of K-12 or whatever. This really is a much tighter thing than that. The STEM practices are, for students to be able to develop these, the students really need an opportunity to having attempted to engage them and learn from those engagement points. The practices at a high level, there are eight of them. And this is what a student needs to be able to do. Because sometimes teachers will look at this and say, well, I do that. Well, that's not the point. It's the students not doing it. It's a student being able to demonstrate the skill. And there's a difference between a skill and doing. It, you know, doing is uh, mechanical. Uh, a skill is fluid. And so you have to be able to put a student into a context that's fluid and they can demonstrate this, these skills. <coughs> so the student needs to be able to ask questions and define problems, you know, relative to the respective discipline, science and engineering. Student needs to not only be able to use a model but develop one, not only carry out an investigation but plan it, not only interpret data but analyze it, think computationally, construct explanations, design solutions, argue from evidence, obtain, evaluate, and communicate information. All these parts are interconnected. So you, it's the kind of concept of adding practices into what you do. You can't just add developing and using a model. Because in order for a student to be able to develop a model, it actually means being part of planning and carrying out an investigation. And the purpose of the model is to yield data, which requires interpreting, analyzing and interpreting that data. So uh, these things happen in conjunction with each other, at least in high quality instructional environments. I mean, people do attempt all kinds of crazy things. But it's key that you kind of picture students in the role being challenged to actually not only use a model but develop it. And using a model is, you know, here's the you know, here's all the arrows of the food chain. Drop the, drop the, the plants and animals into it. Um, follow the procedure that I'm giving you. Copy off the board. That's all using. That's all carrying out. But the students have to plan. They have to develop. That's key. It looks all of these things are necessary K to 12, and so what. The practices doesn't change, but the level of sophistication and complexity with which that practice is applied and how students engage it is uh, what changes. So you know you may have you're going to have less variables in K1-2 than you're going to have in three through five and through six through eight and so on. So second grade students in this example, you know they've engaged in uh, a well-developed curriculum. Actually, these are some of our students um, or students of teachers who are engaged in our programming. And they start with a non piece of nonfiction reading, but it's brief. And what it does is it lays a, a foundation for Socratic dialogue. So the teacher is replacing lecture with thoughtful and higher order questions. And so when you think about that, the purpose of the Socratic dialogue is asking questions that require students to respond by using their creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skills in the context of the content that they've read about and that's the purpose of the particular lesson and unit. And the teacher is not acting as a sage to validate the students' responses. They're acting as a coach to bring in other students to that conversation to 
ask them if they agree or disagree and why, how, what evidence, where. Those are the kind of questions, okay? Students need to be trained to think and using higher order thinking skills. Uh, often, all too often, students are trained to think using lower order thinking skills. They're asked questions like, what? And so then students say, well, I don't know. You never told me what it is. And so, you know, what really indicates fill in the blank? Um, very lower order, just remembering, understanding, and applying. That's lower order thinking skills. These two students are more like fifth graders, and they are engaged as engineers. So when you think about that Socratic dialogue process, and the, the children before were engaged as scientists, uh, that, sci that, that higher um, order discussion, the Socratic dialogue, leads to a problem or question which you can break down your students, the whole class, into teams of two, and they can apply the practices of science and engineering to the context and try and solve that problem or that question um, by using the scientific process or the engineering design process which requires those skills. So that's what these two students are doing. They are taking apart a problem, thinking about it, trying to come up with a solution, and they are, um, you know, they're doing, they're engaging in something that's their ideas. The, they're collaborating to come up with one idea from both of their ideas. And it's not something they've been shown. They don't know the answer to this problem. It's something that's within reach, uh, and there are multiple ways to reach it, but they have no idea. It's not that they've seen a demonstration and now they're going to go do what they've seen. Okay, that kind of a model is a thing of the past. That pre-teaching and so on is, you know, I'll show you and then you go and do what I've done or something like it. It's not that's got to go away. So um, what's great though is is that this is very engaging because it's the students' ideas coming to life. They're creating a plan. They're going to carry out their plan, build their prototype, test their prototype, use the data to reflect on whether or not that prototype solved the problem or in the case of science, uh, the experiment, whether the data yielded from the, ex from the experiment actually um, you know, gave support or not for the hypothesis that was being tested to answer the question. That's how you look at something like ELA and Math Common Core becomes integrated because those students that you just saw are developing nonfiction text. I mentioned nonfiction reading already. Uh, Socratic dialogue, as well as this text, is uh, communication standards, also process writing and other technical writing standards, um, reading strategies get applied, and so on. So ELA comes alive in the context of science. The creative and analytical thinking skills benefit ELA. Math, the same way, those uh, math common core practices the use of operations, the data collection, the graphing, all of that is related to Math Common Core. And I'll give you an example of some of those specific uh, practices in a minute. So keep the, in mind that Bloom's taxonomy uh, is a six-layer pyramid, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. The reality, though, is with the next generation science standards and the type of next generation inquiry environment you need to be creating so that students reach a level of proficiency is, that, is such that creating, evaluating, and analyzing need to happen simultaneously. And what that, and you can kind of picture that because if a student is in that environment where they have read about something and discussed it as a class and really got their thinking going, made concept to concept, concept to self, concept to world connections, and now there's a problem or question that they don't know the answer to, but they have some related knowledge and they have a tool set that they can employ and some logic in the scientific process, the engineering design process, which they can uh, follow to go from a problem to an evidence-based conclusion or a question to an evidence-based conclusion. That requires analyzing the problem or question, evaluating the options and what's already known, creating a plan to, uh, you know, for a prototype or for an uh, experiment, which then yields data which they have to analyze and evaluate their approach and actually create an explanation, use that evidence-based reasoning um, to support a claim.
So this all happens simultaneously. It's really important to have that be the focus of your instruction. Applying, understanding, and remembering just isn't enough. It doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that if that's, if that's what your activities look like, um, you've missed the boat. Creating, evaluating, analyzing is the big focus. The, um, that, that comes into play in these new next generation science assessments because and as you've, as you've uh, probably seen by now, depending on when you are watching this, that the Kansas Science Summative Assessment for the uh, College and Career Readiness Standards for Science really, uh, as of 2015-16, have gotten um, some kind of basic alignment to the NGSS, which is intended to be um, you know, implemented going forward, sort of refined. So, so some of the key changes here versus the assessments that you're accustomed to, if you haven't already seen it, is basically that those uh, tested indicators are gone. It's not, it's not about memorizing and drilling a specific detail, but what it's about is students developing a skill which, was, which is broadly useful and developing uh, knowledge, specific knowledge, which is interconnected and and easily or um, reasonably extended, and that's huge. Now, when you look at uh, the um, the new assessments, so at grade five, grade eight, and and grade eleven, they're not only assessing that grade level. They're assessing all the prior grade levels as well. So again, back to that idea that curriculum um, is, you know, something that, uh, you know, you, you teach science in the year that the test happens or that you only teach the grade level sp uh, specific standards when they are indicated in that grade level. Um, you know, it needs to be in the grade level, but it also needs to be in adjacent grade levels as things that are introduced and reinforced because these standards are a system of standards, it's a system of knowledge, and a system of skills. Um, so you, you know, to, to do it otherwise is a big mistake. A couple other pieces. So when you see these, at least in the near future, the department has said that, because of budget reasons, that the, there will be only selected responses, kind of a multiple choice and drag and drop. And what you've seen is, um, and I haven't seen any or heard anyone uh, mention it this way, but um, the, Depart uh, the District of Columbia is really the one that most people are copying for these next generation science assessments, and I'll show you what those look like. And um, through your own experience, you can decide how close they are or not. But um, they are going to be, uh, they are acting as a model nationally and um, are in line with other states who have, uh, like the uh, number of New England states, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island, who have used the New England Common Assessment Program, which is not entirely aligned, uh, but it's a pretty close model for what the DC uh, aligned assessments became and as the um, the Kansas assessments, uh, summative assessments, are kind of developed. They will reflect that most likely as well. So, so, the, so we'll take a look at what that looks like. The, the, the key though is that it is all multiple choice, but it's not the multiple choice that you're used to. And something that I think is really um, kind of key that you you can find is that you know there's no way students who are um, I guess on, there's kind of two ways to view it. Students who are receiving quality science education across each of these grade spans are going to be successful on the assessment. Those who are not, are not going to be prepared to learn at the next level. And un unfortunately, thinking about high school, the next level is college or career. And uh, I mean, frankly, you, if as we're talking about higher order thinking, I mean, if a student can't think, then they're going to have a real hard time being successful in the workforce and being trainable by employers to do specific jobs or, you know, and the thing is, is that it's not, specific job doesn't mean, you know, 
factory work, you know, some putting the top on, on the jar this way. What it means is being able to take a base of skills and some basic knowledge and do something that's really specialized and something that can't be automated and something that, um, you know, is really valuable. That's how students end up with a bright future. So uh, I want to show you um, how these practices and these three dimensions get applied in this example um, from DC since it is the first in, in the nation uh, NGSS assessment. So you can see here they're assessing more than grade five standards. They're, in their case, they have uh, open response items or constructed responses, which the Kansas assessments at this time, because of budget reasons they've said, are not really intending to do. But I want to show you what they look like anyways, because if they do get the budget, uh, it would be a logical next step and something that's probably going to come quickly anyways and there would not be much fanfare about it. Um, so what happens is you get these sort of scenarios that mirror a scientific investigation by fictional students in a classroom, have all the parts of the scientific process. Now there's a difference between practices and processes and I want to just mention this quickly. That the practices of science are the skills specific to the discipline. The process of science and of engineering as well uh, they're different processes. Um, those processes are the logical kind of framework to go from a problem to an evidence-based solution or a, a question to an evidence-based answer. I mention this um, because some folks are of, of the mindset that um, the scientific method, the engineering design process go away under these new standards. No, 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 no. They actually become even more important. Science and engineering are not linear. They're described. Nobody's making that claim, but they're very logical. And logical in terms of the way you pursue something. If you have a question, you research it. You take what you know, you form a hypothesis. You take that hypothesis and you create some boundaries of uh, how you plan to experiment with this. And then you develop a list of specific materials and quantities and a procedure for how you're going to employ those materials to generate data and test that hypothesis. You carry that out, you gather the data, and then you form an evidence-based conclusion. That is all logic. That's all it is, right? You wouldn't have a conclusion without data. You wouldn't have data without a, a process to actually get the data, the, the procedure itself. You wouldn't have a procedure if you didn't have a question and a hypothesis. So logic is key here. So uh, don't have a simple view of process uh, that it is unnecessary because practices exist. Practices are the tools that you need to execute the process. And I'll just give you a quick example. In writing, we, in teaching children writing, we teach them the writing processes, sorry, the practices and the processes. The practices are word choice, voice, tone, and sentence structure, so on. Those are the tools to be able to write well. However, to create a high quality published work, you need to brainstorm, um, pre you know, pre-write or uh, draft, edit, revise, and then publish. So the practices of writing are necessary, but the process is a logical framework to go from the idea to the high quality published work. Keep that in mind. That's um, how you need to be manifesting in the sense of uh, pulling practices and processes of science together in the classroom. Students develop the skill, they apply the skill by applying the logic of the disciplines. So there are other kinds of assessments here too that are drag and drop. So this would, this would be something you would find in Kansas under the current, um, the current intentions. And multiple choice, well guess what? Multiple choice can now have multiple right answers in which you have to select all of them. So select three out of six. You can't just eliminate an answer or two. Um, not that easy. Guessing is much harder now. You can see how they extend them though into the open responses very easily. So over here, the, the scenario gave way to asking the student who's being tested which claim is correct, Trevor or Kayla's, explain why the claim the one that you're selecting is correct um, and use evidence from their data table to support that claim. Over here, they drag and drop the organisms into a food web and then explain 
the shortest path for energy from the plant or the plants to the fox. Okay, over here, multiple choice. Well, the students have a scenario, and notice that Trevor and Kayla, those fictional students from the first example, are following through the assessment. So the students have to consider that context and then actually look at the model of the food chain that's here, follow the statements best describes the movement of matter, and select uh, three correct answers. Okay. It can be extended into an open response item or a constructive response, as some people call it, by using the model to then describe the relationship between organisms in the pond food chain, food chain and the exchange of matter back into the environment. And so that's connecting what you see here to a life cycle okay, and also a food web because, say, a minnow dies. Bacteria are part of the food chain here and are going to transfer that matter into, um, you know, by virtue of the life cycle of the minnow dying, the bacteria is going to decompose the minnow and make that matter available to the algae or perhaps other organisms in here. Um, but again, this being an assessment, we wouldn't assume there are other organisms, the algae, to then go back into the food chain. So that type of thinking, to be able to look at a scenario, take it apart, consider its parts, and look for things that are not explicitly labeled, that are labeled but not um, explicitly explained the way the arrows are explaining the food chain here, um, is part of that skill set and, and actually d displaying it. And here's a couple other examples. Scenario, multiple choice. Again, three out of five. Scenario, constructed response. So until until the constructive responses come into play in Kansas, you're going to be dealing with things like this, but these are difficult and they require the same skills. It's just that um, it's a little bit less dynamic than the constructive responses that you see either being tagged on to those multiple choices or the ones that are based out of the full-blown scenario. Now, big key takeaway here. There's a new definition of effective STEM instruction. For your classroom to be effectively instructing students and your school and your district, uh, you can't be doing what you see on the left. Um, you need students engaged in what you see on the right. And what I mean by that is this teacher is pre-teaching, they're modeling, and what these children on the left are doing is they're trying to absorb and remember all of that so they can go and do it themselves. Not doing something new and novel, but they're just doing the same thing themselves no different than a demonstration. The demonstration being repeated by a student demonstrating to themselves. These children on the right, like I explained earlier, they haven't seen what they're doing before. They're just using their skills and those processes to try to get it done using what they know. And they're learning from that in the process and making those connections. And then they'll debrief with the class and the, uh, as the class comes back together because all the teams are doing a different approach or are engaged in a different approach to that same problem. So. Uh, so that you know is engaging. The, the definition of effective STEM instruction is this. Effective science instruction capitalizes, and this is the National Research Council, capitalizes on students' early interest and experience. So it starts in pre-K and kindergarten, goes all the way up, identifies and builds on what they know. So it's intentionally nurturing from one grade level to the next in September through June. Nurturing, that means scaffolding. That means thoughtfully articulating the lessons, the units, OK? A unit in a lesson is not three pages, and it's not three months either. It's you know a week. Uh, a lesson's a week long. It's a month-long unit. It's lessons within that unit that scaffold, and those units scaffold so that the vocabulary and the practices are going. And so the vocabulary is scaffolding, and the practices are being used over and over and over again. Students are experiencing them. They're engaged in them, and that's uh, specifically mentioned here, experiences to engage in the practices. This is an experience where those students are engaging those pra eight practices we were talking about earlier, and it's sustaining their interest because it's their ideas. Okay, Just sort of wrapping up, what I want to show you is a model uh, that we described in another webinar called uh, How to Assess Your Curriculum for Alignment with NGSS because we go through the five key pivots under peak alignment that curriculum needs to make, instruction needs to make in order to be NGSS aligned. One of them is obviously integrating ELA and math and those practices and so on. Well, 
not just the students here generating a nonfiction text, creating an evidence-based writing, uh, process writing, so on and so forth, but starting with engaging in nonfiction reading, not as the way to master and learn content, but as a way to get some background, just basic foundation. Then taking that further through Socratic dialogue and those students in Socratic dialogue being asked those higher order questions and making those concept to concept, concept to self, concept to world connections, and then coming to the problem or question which the class breaks down into their teams, actually plans their own investigations, the students plan their own investigations using the scientific or engineering design process, employing their skills, and then carry out their plan. This is, and by the way, this planning is not without accountability. It's a full release of responsibility, but with accountability checkpoints. Carrying out that plan, gathering the data, forming an evidence-based conclusion, and then sharing it out and debriefing with the class. These are the processes I'm talking about, scientific and engineering design. Similar but different, serving a different purpose. Remember, science starts with questions, engineering starts with problems. Um, research is involved, but then it changes pretty dramatically thereafter. You can find steps that are related, but they're in different places, or similar, but in different places. A key piece is that engineering is integrated with science, that you can imagine, and this is something we do, uh, this is an example right from one of our seventh grade units, that students learn science, as scientists, they engage in that uh, sort of inquiry environment where they are applying their skills to learn which material is most permeable to groundwater. Uh, by trying to answer that question. And the thing is, is that the reason they're doing this and what was prior to it was the reading and the discussion around water cycle aquifers, permeable earth materials, um, how aquifers are replenished by surface water, and so on, and how surface water becomes groundwater. The, um, so that's building knowledge about the discipline uh, and that disciplinary core idea. In the next lesson, we talk about pollution, the surface pollution. How does surface pollution become groundwater pollution and then travel miles, potentially, to wells even? Um, well, that's related to that water cycle. It's related to the permeable earth materials. And so students can engage that as a problem in the context of engineering and pull the science knowledge together with the knowledge of the contemporary issue and um, attempt to solve the problem of polluted groundwater by tackling the problem of a fictitious town that needs a water filtration, low-cost water filtration device um, to remove sediment from stormwater runoff. And so they use the engineering design process to plan their investigation, diagram their prototype, plan their test and carry it out, gather their data, and then form an evidence-based conclusion about whether or not that is uh, solving the problem, and then compare that to solutions generated by their peers. Of course, anything we're teaching, so that's you know bringing it full circle back to engineering, anything we're teaching in terms of the dimensions as well as the performance expectations are something that aren't just assessed at the state level, but really are assessed at the classroom level. So in our case, uh, and this is really a way you want to do it, but uh, whether you develop your own or, or look at ours or whatever, um, creating similar you know, scenarios which tease out different aspects of those three dimensions so that um, you can really understand if a student is proficient and able to demonstrate the expectations or not and where the weaknesses are. Uh, and you can see this is a seventh grade example. If you want to check out this particular example, you can download a seventh grade unit from our website and, uh, and see something like this. We have the other, um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we have we have full year curriculum for each of the grade levels, but we only make one of it, one month's worth of content available as a sample to folks for free, um, simply because that's how we pay our bills. Um, but at the same point, it gives you, I think, a good picture of what NGSF aligned curriculum looks like, uh, even if it's a month, a one month piece. The um, connection between ELA technical subject standards and and the math practices, just real briefly, you can see that uh, following precisely a multi-step procedures in science at the ELA, information being expressed visually is actually an ELA standard. These are a couple examples from middle school. Uh, citing text evidence to support analysis, all ELA standards. Math common core practices, making sense of problems, reasoning abstractly, um, 
constructing viable arguments, critiquing the reasoning of others. This is a culture of critique that you should be viewing your classroom to be. That students critiquing students, um, their own ideas in their teams, and between teams, and you as, as a skillful educator who's leading these discussions, um, you're not critiquing it by validating, you're critiquing by asking questions. And then when it comes to accountability checkpoints, as students are progressing through the scientific process or the engineering design process, you're actually holding them accountable. You know, they, they, after a couple of steps, they're coming to you to show and explain what they've done, and you're going to ask questions. And you're going to help them understand if they haven't met the expectation. And if they have met the expectation, great. Then you're letting them advance. So again, even more engaging, because if I meet your expectations, uh, I get to advance as a scientist or engineer toward carrying out my plan and the hands-on sort of project-based aspect of all this, too. So it's really kind of key. Um, that the, all these practices come alive in this environment. Uh, uh, I guess one pointer I would mention around the types of resources that are available right now, they kind of fall into categories, and I'm just going to briefly go over this. Awareness resources are basic sort of downloadable resources you get oftentimes for free from museums or from companies. They just make, the result of that is not that students are really equipped to engage in engineering across all the disciplines. That's mastery readiness. Um, as well as in science and uh, pull all these aspects of the different dimensions together. What it is is it's it's um, it's just making students aware of what an engineer is, who they are, kind of the basic. Engineers solve problems. If a student can, you know, what does an engineer do? They can solve, and students raise their hands, oh, it's engineers solve problems. That's the result of awareness readiness resources. Uh, knowledge readiness resources are like textbooks. All, they explain all about what scientists have discovered and engineers have created in terms of trying to solve problems. It's backward looking and it's just sort of again the old fact model, right? Performance readiness is about learning how to perform a task in relation to, you know, a particular prompt. So for instance, learning all about rocks and minerals, we associate this typically with kits, the old kind of three kit a year, four kit a year model um, that's been around since the 70s. And so those those performance ready resources are you know learn all about this and there's a culminating activity so you learn all about rocks and minerals and then a culminating activity is to you know take the the mineral and scratch it on the different surfaces to determine its hardness and you fill out the sheet right um, that's just learning to perform the task of a hardness test to find out the hardness of a rock or mineral it's not knitting it all together the way that you have to at a mastery level. And that's what we really aim for is mastery readiness, where students are developing skills as a tool set and process knowledge as a, as a, as a logic framework where they can go into any context, any scenario, and take the basic knowledge that they have, whatever it is, and extend it forward to be able to form an evidence-based uh, or form a, to 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 uh, make a claim and form evidence-based reasoning around that claim. Okay, so you can think about the earlier examples I was giving of the you know fictional students, w one who wants to grow the plant or is growing they're growing beans, one in water and one in soil, and you know they have. Uh, different ideas about how the plants will grow, they gather their data, and then they come to different conclusions. The student on the outside who's being assessed has to be able to look at that, use their practice knowledge, their process knowledge, their content knowledge, and form, come up with a claim and form evidence-based reasoning around that. Really key. Um, I mentioned there's the connection between science, technology, engineering, and math, and the arts. Some people are calling it STEAM. Uh, it's the higher order thinking. It's the culture of critique. Pablo Picasso and his most famous work, Guernica, is a um, great example of this. Artists are not people who make things pretty. Interior decorators make things pretty. The artists are people who communicate through mediums like oil on canvas, sculpture, dance, music. Okay, they're actually making a statement other than in, you know, verbally. Um, there's English language arts because we can make statements in writing. Pablo uh, is an example of this because he lived in exile. He lived in exile because it wasn't popular. You know, the statements that he was making weren't popular. And um, he was, 
being persecuted. And Guernica was an example of one of these statements where uh, the town of Guernica had had atrocities committed against it by the fascists. And so uh, he made a statement about this when he was commissioned to create a work for the International Art Exposition. He created this piece of chaos and destruction and mayhem and everything else. He called it Guernica and he sent it off and the fascists, he communicated this message to the world and even to the fascists about these atrocities and the fascists even came back to him and said, what did you do here? And he said, I didn't do it. And this is a, you know, kind of a famous quote sort of thing. He said, I didn't do it, you did. And so keep in mind that um, it was intentional and I think that's really great evidence of that, that he made an intentional statement to a very specific audience. And so that takes those science and engineering practices, it takes a higher order thinking and the math practices we were talking about. And for, for somebody to be able to make such a targeted statement to a targeted audience. And I guess the key piece I want you to take away from this is that, that art is communication. It's intentional communication and that by training students to think critically and with these science and engineering practices, we are making better creators and consumers of art, but we're also really making better communicators as well as consumers of communication. So the ability to be better, you know, uh, understood as, as well as a well-spoken individual. And so really key pieces to think about here in terms of how you approach art in the classroom. Is it about making things pretty or is it about communicating something in that medium? And by you know, choosing your colors and choosing your you know, shapes and all these sort of things very intentionally because you're aiming it at somebody specific. Um, in, in just in closing here, I'm just going to show you. So, Thinking about curriculum, professional development, and materials, they have to fit the glove to support that STEM learning experience in the classroom. It doesn't diminish the role of the teacher. It doesn't remove creativity. But what it does is it frees the teacher and places teachers in alignment with each other from one grade level to the next so that they can focus on coaching and meeting the needs of the students and bringing in those place-based connections and um, helping ex children extend their knowledge by really skillful questioning. So it, it, it's really a great thing to be able to focus on student needs. So these are just examples from us. Again, if you have any questions about this, you can reach out to us and we'd be happy to kind of uh, talk to you about that. So just examples of, you know, we tend to work with really leading uh, districts. And by leading, I don't mean uh, affluent and I don't mean ideal. What I mean is we tend to work with individuals, uh, particularly schools and districts. We don't sell to individuals, but um, we work with folks who want change and are attempting change because, frank frankly, t change takes effort. If you're just looking for science, you're just looking to fill some time, um, that doesn't take effort, but it's also not particularly effective. So you have to kind of choose, you know, why why you're doing what you're doing, I suppose. But here's an example where um, the state average is 50%. And this school has 72% low-income students, 75% high needs, 65% free lunch, and 35% ELL students. And they, over the course of two and a half years, uh, added 51 points to their advanced proficient scoring students. Now, there's been shocks along the way. And that's the result of changes in teacher, changes in administrator, and so on. So, uh, and this is an urban school. Um, a lot of kids who are new to the country. The key I want to point out here is that because teachers are collaborating, even when there are shocks, students are building, and, uh, and also because students are building these skill sets and understanding that when there's a shock, the kids still don't fall as far as they were previously. And then you pick up and you're able to continue building. So that's why you see this positive trend here. In other environments where there's more stability, where there's only 20% high needs or 7% low income, this is the kind of thing you see where you get these big gains and then they're able to be maintained over time. And then the, the goal to be able to get to 100% advanced and proficient really is about pushing the students' thinking such that they're really, really dialed in and getting every last point. Um, in sort of an example of a really low, 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 low middle school where there's 4% proficient students. To start with, over the course of two years, these, this team 
added 24 points to their student proficiency levels and also reduced the warning and failing students by half. And where they're at uh, presently, this is the most recent data, um, they are in line with the average of their peers, the other 26. This is an example from Massachusetts uh, Middle School, in line with the uh, performance of the 26 largest uh, cities in Massachusetts. And that's this school is a part of one of them. Um, so they have gone from well below average to average, and then now with this positive trend, hopefully continue to improve and add on those gains. And this is a difficult environment, 97% high needs, 87% free lunch, 95% low income, 15% uh, ELLs, and 64% whose first language isn't even English. You can see those gains up here over time. So with that, I um, and we also, you know, there's other states too, and actually we have users in Kansas if you would like to go visit or ask questions, um, see what this looks like actually within Kansas, feel free to reach out. Uh, this is an example from um, New Hampshire. And you can see our groups are always above the state average. The state average is in pink and in purple. These are successive years, um, as much as 30% in some cases. Um, like I said, if you'd like to check out what this looks like in Kansas, feel free to reach out that we have some folks in Kansas that are using. Um, and you uh, are welcome to do that. Uh, in order to set that up, you'd have to reach Mary Ellen uh, DeLacy, who's a curriculum specialist. If you do download things off our website and you have questions about it, um, she's another great person to ask about that. Her email address and phone number is there for you. There's another piece that really looks at how you implement this operationally in terms of the NGSS, not no Adam specifically, but the NGSS specifically, how to implement that in the classroom, construct curriculum and all that kind of stuff. You can access that on demand at noadam.com forward slash strategically. And uh, there are a bunch of other free resources and I'm going to flash that up here for you so that you just know uh, they're available and if you want to engage them, you can. So uh, one is those curriculum and reader samples I mentioned. Uh, those at noadam.com. You can use this link or you can actually go just to noadam.com, top of the page, click STEM curriculum and scroll down for the grade levels. Uh, only a month per grade is there. The rest are, like I said, available um, for purchase, but not, not online uh, for download. The case studies are available, so you can see what this data looks like up close when people do this, even under assessments which are not uh, NGSS aligned, which is really great. Uh, subscribe to our blog. It's free. It's a good way to stay connected. Follow us on uh, Facebook, no, facebook.com forward slash noadam, on Twitter at noadam. It's our handle, and we have a bunch of other free and live resources, ebooks, uh, on-demand webinars, live webinars, uh, discussions with innovators that are available, noadam.com forward slash resources. Or you can just go to noadam.com at the top of the page. You'll see a resources link and click there. It's been a great pleasure to be able to speak with you today, and I appreciate your time. If you do have any questions for me, feel free to reach out. My name is Francis Vigent. You can send those to Mary Ellen DeLacy. I'm CEO here, and I will get back to you uh, myself. I'll get back to you personally and, and hopefully be able to answer those questions. Good luck on implementing or uh, mastering at this point the ne Next Generation Science Standards, and I hope, for, I hope and look forward to perhaps seeing you at the uh, Strategically Implementing webinar uh, as well. Good luck and good day. Bye-bye.